Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's 6.30 in the morning. You know what that means? It's time to get your horns up. That's right. Get your horns up with Aaron Little from HornsPlus.com and Nash from Texas, who loves to talk about his home state, the, state, the flagship university of the school. How are you doing, gentlemen? Doing good this morning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, I've, I think I've only got about a week and a half left on this great planet because of the National League wildcard race is going to be the death of me. I'm like, I'm not going to survive. I'm way too reliant on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, absolutely pathetic pitching staff winning meaningless games for them and helping the Diamondbacks. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really going to soak in these last few shows with you guys because it's been, it's been a great ride. Good for you, man. At least you're going to go out doing what you love, watching baseball. I am. The last time the Diamondbacks made the playoffs, um, I had not yet met my wife and our one year anniversary has already passed. So I don't know. Like, I just, I need this. It's been so long. <laughs> well, if you do kick it, we'll miss you at first. Thank you. I appreciate and, that. Uh, just make some weird references. We'll find someone else to help with the baseball stuff when, when, base, when Texas baseball season comes around. There you go. See, Nash, Nash is already thinking about how to replace yeah, we're already getting replacements with himself. We need to hit up Occupy left field. <laughs> hey, good morning. I guess Zach could, just, Zach could just take – Zach could do all the stuff I do. Uh, I don't know. Let's throw Nash a bone. We'll get him in there. Get the press pass. He'll, he'll be more than happy to go cover some games. No, Oh, man, I would love to see Nash with the no rooting in the press box rule. That would be perfect. <laughs> no rooting in the press – oh, no, yeah, no, no. It's like – I'm no, sorry. Yeah. No, <laughs> what would happen is I don't know if y'all seen Porter Brown fix his swing, but the first Porter Brown dinger that leaves right field and goes a hundred feet over the fence, I, I'd be going, Woo! I'd be screaming, I'd be, yelling, I'd be saying, I'd be patting that wall, going, Craig, you see that? You see that, Craig? Yeah. All That's right. so funny because like Texas, been, like they're actually like like they're not a stickler about it. Like we talk like pro Texas sometimes, but, uh, but you would definitely take it way too far. Yeah. yeah no, I, That's I, just scratched I, I you off the list of potentials. Cause he doesn't want that headache. <laughs> I prefer being down in my seat right next to the field where I can, where I'm encouraged to be loud. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Guys. Benny Rogers is the first on the specs chat line this morning with a good morning. Good morning, Benny. It's a fine, beautiful day. And, uh, right behind him is Chris Rodon. Hey, Chris, love the score prediction. But you need to do it tomorrow and put it in the comments of tomorrow's show because nobody won the Malik Murphy jersey last week. So it's still up for grabs to anyone who can correct the first person to correctly predict this week's score. So, uh, you know, there you go. And, yeah, Larry, go Navy, beat Army. Michael Harges knows what time it is. It's time to get your horns up. Go Astros in the house with their horns up as well go astros if i only have a week and a half left uh he might also because <laughs> as stressed as i am about the national league wild card the american league i'm not gonna talk about baseball all day the american league west and al wild card picture like it's so tight at the top between the astros rangers and mariners and then the blue jays are in the mix for the final or the final two wild card spots so like there's a scenario where going into the last day of the season one of those AL West teams could go from winning the division to entirely missing the playoffs. Um, so, yeah, I mean. Talk about cannibalism, man. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a mess. And, and remember how everyone talked about, you know, the expanding of the baseball playoffs was going to ruin the game? Yeah, oh, I that, never thought that. But, yeah, people did say that. Yeah. And people say that about the college football playoff expansion, too, and they're just as nuts. I, you know I love playoff expansion. It's, it's the best. <laughs> By the way, Barry in the Philippines saying he's going to put out a hype video if it's not raining. What are the odds it's going to rain in the Philippines in a tropical jungle? Good luck with that, anyway. Barry. And good morning to Data. It's, fun fact uh, on, or Dale, sorry. <laughs> good morning, indeed. A fun fact for Chris is uh, if Chris's prediction is right, that will, that will set the record for the largest margin of victory that Texas has had over Baylor. Oh, by far, yeah. Early, well, no, no, not by far, by one point. Currently, oh, one point. <laughs> current, yeah, currently the largest margin of victory was in 1913, 77 to zero, and then, uh, but that is a 78 point margin right there that Chris. I wonder has. if any of those guys are still around to help Baylor on the offensive line, or maybe play quarterback. No, maybe they're 50 to seven. They they did have a game where they won 50 to seven versus uh, Texas in 1989, but you know the 80s, not a good, 
my dad's my dad scarred from the eighties, man. <laughs> I, it was it was a tough time to be a Texas oh, fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, because a And M was good. It was a harder fun time then than what we've gone through over the last 12, 13, 15 years. It, it was, yeah, because A and M was very good. I mean, heck, I remember Texas losing to Rice. That may have been the early nineties, but I'm just saying, like that's that's some that's some tough football right there. Yeah, eighty five to seven. Get that prediction in tomorrow, Chris. And Max Jefferson checking in with the horns up because it's time to get your horns up. Let's tame those bears and wake up. You can't tame a bear, right? I mean, there's no such thing. And look, even even the nice bears still steal picnic baskets. So, I mean, there's they're wild bears. Bears are wild. That's all that happens. We are talking Baylor today. We're going to open up the scouting report a little later. We're talking with um, Stewart, Cameron Stewart. I knew I'd get there. Cameron Stewart from the Locked On Baylor podcast. We actually spoke with him yesterday, so we're going to play that a little later in the show. It was a really good interview. Uh, but right now, I kind of wanted to talk Quinn Ewers and the passing game. And, and the question of the day is, is Quinn Ewers a game manager? So real quick, before you, and I know Nash is going to want to jump on me. I, I I throw these things out, and it just drives him nuts. You could just see it in his face. He's like, game manager. I, I hate that. I hate – no, hold on. I say this. I hate that people say that because it's just me just – like, this might – like, mine – I used to – this is like a lifelong thing for me. I will literally just – like, nothing will be going wrong. I'm just sitting there chilling. And somebody will be like, hey, what, what's wrong? Nothing. No, you can tell me what's wrong. No, nothing. No, seriously, you can tell me what's wrong. I, I'm telling you right now, now I have something wrong with me. <laughs> Maybe you just got resting, irritated face. I don't Probably. Know. <laughs> it's been a lifelong thing. I don't care. I love it anyway. But, yeah, so, look, Quinn Ewers, two out of the three games, he's had pretty pedestrian stats, right? I mean, last week, for instance, 11 of 21, less than 200 yards passing. He did have two touchdowns, but pedestrian stats against Rice and Wyoming. He looked great against Alabama, though. So, but the one stat he has that absolutely is critical and has been huge, zero turnovers, goose egg. All of that, though, leads me – that is the very definition of a game manager quarterback. Pedestrian stats, but no turnovers. He's smart with the football. He keeps teams in the game. Quinn Ewers has all the talent in the world to be an elite quarterback. Quinn Ewers could be a top 10 NFL draft pick. Quinn Ewers has what it takes to, to be the best of the best. But right now, for this season, his sophomore year – is he a game manager, Nash? I uh, I don't think so. I think he's just, you know, executing the plays that are called from Steve Sarkeesian. Like to to really go back to the Rice game, people got people got pissed that he was. Oh my god, we we took five we took five deep throws and then and then versus Wyoming, it's like well we didn't we didn't complete a single we didn't attempt a single deep ball. What's wrong? What's going on? Uh, it it just comes down to the throws that. You can't you can't take a shot on a on a deep ball if it, if there's no call for it, uh, and if you look at the the big games the games that we're going to need the deep ball and that's, that Sark knows hey, we got to have the deep ball in. If you go and look at the top uh, top fifteen ranked opponents that we have, he has twenty two big time throws per PFF across his entire career at Texas. Eighteen of those coming uh, coming all those games where we play a top fifteen opponent. So. I think this is an aspect of Quinn Ewers that's actually like the game manager. I don't think that it's necessarily like it doesn't bother me anything like that, but I think that people are overlooking the fact that he's a really like he can perform underneath the lights. And then this is actually something that I was listening to a tech, uh, not to, uh, to just a college football YouTuber. He was breaking down the uh, Ohio State game versus Notre Dame and he was saying, hey, Sam Hartman, we've seen Sam Hartman play in a big game before. So we know what we have like we we have we know what we have in Sam Hartman. Kyle McCord, you you've never seen Kyle McCord play in a big game. So he could go out there and he could when the when the lights are on, 
you know, and the lights are bright and everything, like the pressure's on, he can go out there and be a dud. We know that Quinn, you're. Yeah, did we lose? Going to be if he has a bad game, it's because the wide receiver had a bad game. All right. Well, you know what? There's there's a lot of truth to that. And listen, Sark has said, oh. when asked about the play, the, oh, no. the offensive passing game this week, Sark said it's got to improve all the way around. He said Quinn has to improve. The wide receivers has to improve. He said he has to improve when it comes to the pass game. Wow. Everyone just – nobody liked what I had to say. That's fine. I'm just telling you – so. Sark says the passing game's got to improve greatly. I'm just going to ramble until they come back. And you guys can join in the chat. Guys like Too Broke to Pay Attention, who checked in to say he's just a game manager, in between a game manager and or a good to great quarterback. I think there's some truth to that. Quinn Ewers, he's a redshirt sophomore. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with him still progressing. Right. And and even though he's a red shirt sophomore, in actuality, he's a true sophomore because his first season was the year that he was he joined Ohio State late. You know, he he skipped his senior year of high school, went to Ohio State, but he joined late. He didn't get in for the start of the fall camp. He got in like two weeks before the, the games began. So he it's not like he had a full camp to prepare. And then he was scout team quarterback at best for Ohio State before transferring in December. I don't count that as a legitimate redshirt year. There's no way he got the the knowledge poured into him. He didn't get the effort poured into him during that season. They were focused on winning games. So your fourth string quarterback isn't going to get a ton of attention. So let's just write off that. He's in, in essence a true sophomore quarterback. The fact that he's progressing is natural, and it's a good thing. And by the way, the fact that he has zero interceptions is a damn good thing. That Wyoming game could have turned out very differently had he not had had Quinn thrown turnovers. Had he been, if he was a turnover prone quarterback, that was 10 10 going into the start of the fourth quarter. If he doesn't, if he doesn't get you know, if he turns the ball over then, Texas could be looking at a deficit in the fourth quarter instead of the 21-point run that they went on. It's a, uh, It makes a difference. It's a big damn deal that he's not throwing interceptions. And, you know, like Benny Rogers pointed out, the team is 3-0 and and he hasn't turned the ball over. Whether you call it the game manager or, you know, damn good quarterback, He's doing what it takes to win. Dell checking in, saying on the Specs chat line, saying, I think Quinn is doing what's asked of him. Sark always talks about taking care of the football, and he's doing it. Other than that, one or the other two would be starting quarterback. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, if if Quinn wasn't taking care of the football, there would be issues. But there and and Texas wouldn't be three and zero. Texas wouldn't be, they would have lost one of those first three games, if not more, had Quinn not been taking care of the football. So I know people hate the game manager label, but sometimes game managers win win football games. People probably would have said the same thing about Mac Jones, by the way. Uh, Mac Jones certainly doesn't. Mac Jones doesn't have the talent that Quinn Ewers has. I know he's an NFL quarterback. I know he got drafted in the free, but Mac Jones does not have the talent that Quinn Ewers had. Mac did have the luxury of sitting for three, three and a half years before learning, before getting in the game. He learned the offense inside and out. He knew exactly how to handle things. He was ready to roll from day one with the Sark offense. There was nothing, and and Sark has said this, there was nothing in Sark's offense that he withheld because he was concerned about Mac Jones. Mac Jones was a game manager who got the ball to elite wide receivers who did what they needed to do. Quinn has that luxury too. He can, he has Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, JT Sanders, 
The running backs are all good at catching the ball. He's got all the talent in the world to take care of the game. So if all he has to do is just get the ball to these playmakers and let them go do their thing, what's the matter with that? You can win championships playing that kind of football. Now, again, he had pedestrian he had some pedestrian stats against Wyoming, 11 of 21. I think it was 164 yards or something like that. It wasn't great. But Wyoming coach Craig Bowl said he schemed the whole purpose of his his game was to scheme so that the wide receivers didn't beat them. They would drop eight into coverage. They were running the 335. They would drop eight into coverage. And frankly, I think it took Sark a while to adjust. I mean, I don't think he was fast enough to adjust the game plan to to go to a more run-focused game plan. And when they did, Jonathan Brooks started picking up yards in chunks. When they did that, some of the receiving game opened up. I think we could see a very similar game plan in Baylor. I think Baylor could be scheming to take away the pass, more worried about it than the run. And if they do, I think we're going to see a running game. I, and I'm writing about this in my column on NorthBloods.com, so be sure to check that out. It'll be up later today. I think we could see a running game where, much like Alabama, the Texas often the Texas run game focuses on the edges. They run Baylor runs this three three five defense. They've got their defensive edges lined up in a four technique, which means the inside shoulder of the tackle. They've got the nose guard over generally over the center, but so they've they've stacked the defensive linemen on the interior to clog up the lanes. They rely on the linebackers then to set the edge and keep the plays from bouncing outside. The problem is their linebackers aren't doing that. They're not good at that. So I think we could see a, a run game plan very similar to what we saw in Alabama where Texas runs counters. They attack the edges of the defense with their plays. And I think as soon as we as soon as we see that, you're going to start to see the linebackers playing off, focusing more on the run game as opposed to the pass game. Hey, look at that. Welcome Dude, back. Gentlemen. So, I mean, Nash, we got booted at the exact same time. I don't <laughs> okay. 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 Restream likes me better. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, uh <laughs> We will we will work on that. Travis, did you convince everyone whether or not that Quinn's a game manager? You know what? I don't know. I was just rambling. By the way, Nash, I think you're muted. Uh, I convinced Dale Coleman, who said, I agree with you about the game manager call. He's doing a great job of it. He isn't trying to do more than what's asked of him, protect the ball and move the offense down the field. And Max Jefferson checking in, saying he doesn't need to win a Heisman, just needs to manage and get the ball to playmakers. What do you guys think? you guys agree with Max and Dale? Yeah, so my original point that I was going to make like 10 minutes ago was <laughs> um, I feel like, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't consider him a game manager because I just think he has too much talent. To me, a game manager is someone who like does not have the talent cap- like to where they're not capable of being an elite quarterback. Um, that's that's not funny. <laughs> Texas um, mom is glad to see you did survive. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's about someone who doesn't have the talent to be an elite quarterback. Like Derek Carr is a game manager at times to me. Jimmy Garoppolo is a game manager at times to Rock me because, party. because yeah, because they don't have the ability to go to that next level. For me, Quinn, I think that's just a nice way of saying he's inconsistent. Like, and you couple that with the facts that he just happens to be taking care of the ball. People consider that, Oh, he's a game manager because he's not turning the ball over. No, he's just, He's just playing well, like he's doing a good job taking care of the ball, but he's still like if you have that Alabama game inside of you and you can make some of those specific throws and he can scramble and sometimes to pick up first downs with his legs, I think that's above a game manager level. I just feel like he's inconsistent. So when he's not playing well and he's still taking care of the ball, it can feel like he's a game manager at times, but I think overall he's just a little bit inconsistent. But I don't think that's fair because I think it's hard to identify – game managers in college football because the play calling is so important and it's so easy to get an edge um, to where if you have an elite play caller like Sark, who's just scheming open wide open receivers, sometimes, sometimes he's not, sometimes he is on those days where he is scheming up wide open receivers. It can look like the guy's a game manager because he's just hitting open receivers. But 
I don't know. That's not, that's not how I would classify it personally, but I, I definitely understand the argument for it, but I just, I think he's got too much talent. I think if you have the ability to like play at the level that Quinn Ewers can play at, then to me, you're not a game manager. You might just look like one at times because you're not playing as consistently. Well, that's kind of what I was talking about while you were out is that, you know, look, he's still a sophomore. I think he's still growing and that's fine. But the fact that he's growing, he's he is taking care of the football while he's growing. That's a damn good thing, right? I mean, there's no way Texas is three and oh, if, if Quinn's turning the ball over. So, well, and honestly, I think that this too is a, like to, to what Aaron just said, literally any quarterback that executes the offense efficiently is a game manager. Like it, do, it doesn't matter. Like to, to, like we like to label guys that don't have the, like, like a Brock, like I was saying, like with Brock Purdy, you're just getting to miss your consistency, but he's never going to put up a 300, 400 yard game. That's because Kyle Shanahan isn't calling a game that's going to get it 300, 400 yards through the air. And any quarterback that manages the game and just if it, like a like a lot of people like to point to uh, Mac Jones under Steve Sark, he just was throwing to the open wide receiver and executing. He actually had a lot of high number of games, but to me, he was he was a game. I mean, so I mean, to me, that's what a game manager is. And I'm not sure where people got cut off with me, but uh, when I was talking about this, but I to just wrap it up, I just think he's not. You know, he's not being risky with the ball. He plays well in big uh, in the big games, 18 of 22 big time throws and in, in top uh, against top 15 opponents. And then the wide receivers, to be fair, the wide receivers have been dropping the ball. If you get if you get if you add consistency to the wide receivers, I mean. A lot of the, like some of these balls are like deep, deep throws that like it's these add 100 yards to the game. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> That would. But then again, the flip side of that is you have the quick toss out to Xavier Worthy to start the fourth quarter, who breaks it and takes it 60 something yards. Well, I mean, so I mean, is Quinn supposed to throw the ball down the field? Or no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying that it ball. all counts the deep ball and the. the it I all, know, but I'm just saying, like, there's. counted for a third of Quinn's passing yards Saturday. I mean, but there's. There, that's just Sark. That's just Sark's play call. That's the game that's called. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I think I agree with Nash. It just can be so scheme dependent. I mean, if, if you're calling a bunch of short game and you're executing a bunch of short game, you're just kind of doing what you're supposed to do. And then, you know, Texas is obviously having to adapt the game plan from game to game because they're throwing different looks at them like Sargas talked about in some of these press conferences. So I don't know. I just don't – I wouldn't put him in that bucket because to me, just like, again, the game manager is just like – that the game manager is like your ceiling is – you're taking care of the ball and you're just doing the bare minimum to move the ball down the field and giving the defense a chance. He has a higher ceiling than that. Um, I just think the game manager stuff can be complicated in college to me, just because it's so dependent on the play caller and the scheme and the advantage that the play caller can give you and what it can make it look like from a game management like perspective. And Sark has even shown accountability as far as saying, Hey, you know what that look, this is on me. Like I need to, I, there's times that I need to do a better job and nobody's going to be a bigger critic than me. Of, Stark of said that yesterday, uh, Monday. He said, yeah, that's, that I know, that's what when it comes to the passing game, it's it's on him, it's on Quinn, it's on the wide receivers. It's it, There's blame to go around, and all of it has to improve, starting with him. Um, and you guys missed what I, I said while you were off doing, you know, a morning breakfast. I don't know what you guys were doing. That was Just so weird. Time. That, that, was, um, that was weird. And then I had a tunnel sound because both, both the windows were playing the incognito window. And I realized I was in the fan. <laughs> so I was, I've mentioned how uh, Craig Bull schemed, the Wyoming coach schemed to take away the passing game. They were dropping eight into coverage consistently. He said their number one focus was to take the wide receivers out of the game. They didn't want to get beat by Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell and JT Sanders. They were trying to take that away. So Quinn took what was given to him, you know, which kind of is the definition of the game manager, but it's also smart. You take what's given to you. You don't turn the ball over. Did Texas, you know, have a closer game than what, than what the Vegas had? Absolutely. But they still won by 21 points. They they did what they needed to do. That's why I came out of and we talked about this Monday. I came out of this game more optimistic about Texas than I did even going into it, just because 
you know, if you can show up and, and not have your A game and still pull away by 21 points in the fourth quarter, you're a damn good team. You beat the teams you're supposed to do, and Quinn did what he needed to do Saturday to win. Yeah, I mean, you talk about coming out of the gates without your A game. I'm, you know, we're talking about Baylor today with the scouting report. We've got uh, Cam Stewart coming up later. But one of the main things I want to see from Texas on Saturday is to get back to the old Texas just in one way, just start to execute that script a little bit better. Sark talked about this on Monday, but I was thinking it during the game on Saturday. It was like the whole thing about Sark and this offense going into the year was they're so dominant on the script. Like they come out in the first quarter and they put up a ton of points in the first 20 plays and then the adjustments come and things kind of fade off late in the game. Well, now they're starting off a little bit slower. And then I don't know if you could say they're making adjustments great, but they are eventually getting there in the fourth quarter where they're scoring a lot of points and they're executing. But I would like to see them be able to do both. I mean, that's what the great offenses do. Like it doesn't have to be one or the other. Like it can, they can go out and execute the script really, really well. And then they can make adjustments to the adjustments and then they can still execute in the second half. So that's the next step for the offense. If they can get back to really owning that script is what Scott is what Sark was talking about on Monday that then, I mean, that really makes them dangerous because if you give the Texas defense, if you let them play with a lead, they just become even more dangerous. They already have a lot of guys that can go find the ball and generate turnovers. So Absolutely. if you consistently execute on the script and then force other teams to play from behind, it, I mean, they're, they're really going to be tough to beat. So I think uh, that's one thing I really have my eye on. Well, and also with the new with the new clock rolls, and we've already seen it from Steve Sarkeesian with against Alabama. It, like you can you can honestly you can now and this is what's going to happen with Steve Sarkeesian. If he has a lead on team, coaches are going to realize we don't have four quarters anymore. The game's over in the third. If we don't if we don't get within two two uh, a two game striking distance a two score striking distance. Game's over if, if they're in the fourth quarter and they have more than – if it's a three-score game. Like, especially if we're able to just – like, because – and this is where I, I, I struggle to see if a team is going to try and shut down Texas the way that Wyoming did with the passing game because it left them vulnerable on the ground. Absolutely. And Jonathan Brooke, like, it's just like – and this is something that Steve Sarkeesian has talked about because he's actually really happy about the team and his, he's, the team has some versatility. They can they can tear you up through the air. They can tear you up on the ground, uh, and it's just like you know leaving a, leaving an empty box with Jonathan Brooks. That's not going to be an optimal result for the opposing defense, right? And Steve Sarkeesian, he's going to take that all day long because it, ultimately Steve Sarkeesian, he is just such a football guy. Like deep down, he like. He wants to be physical. He wants to impose his will. He wants to impose a physicality on the other team. Like a lot of people, like they, we, we went into the year, people were saying, oh, well, no, we're going to be a high flying offense. There's going to, we got all these, yeah, we do have all these NFL wide receivers. That's one, that's true. We got an NFL quarterback. That's true. We're turning offensive line. That's true. But the head coach, that's not his MO to just sit there and pass the ball, pass the ball, pass the ball, pass the ball. Everything is predicated off the run for Steve Sarkeesian. Absolutely. And and I think we could see a similar game plan defensively from Baylor on Saturday, which would lead to a similar game plan offensively on Saturday from Texas. I think we could – I was talking about this while you guys were out. I think we could see Texas really hammering, especially the edges um, of the Baylor defense. And we get into that a little bit here with Stuart Coleman of the Locked On Baylor podcast. We, we did an interview with him yesterday. We're about to run that. But first, we've had a lot of good reactions coming in on the Specs chat line. Guys like Danny Wada saying, agreeing with, with Aaron, saying if you put last year's first half offense with this year's second half offense, they're championship favorites. Damn skippy. And Max Jefferson saying they, could be, they can be more balanced. The offense will get there. They're on schedule, if not ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of that to um, – there's a lot of truth to that. I, I think this offense is I, – I, I again, I came out of the Wyoming game more optimistic, not less, and it's because they did what – they took what was given to them, they did what they needed to do, and they still 
beat them handily. And then don't forget, this is a Wyoming team that beat Texas Tech. I know it was week one and it was at home, not on the road, but they still beat Texas Tech. They they are going to compete for a Mountain West Conference championship. They're not a bad team, just like Rice is not a bad team. They're going to, by the way, Rice is taking on South Florida this week. I bet they do a better job in that game. We'll see. They may do a better job playing South Florida than, than Bama did. Bama yeah, well, certainly. I'm, I'm also going to maintain Bama didn't have Jalen in the role. They didn't have their only quarterback I, on the roster I, you know, that's capable of playing right now. Okay. Uh, unless unless you think Tyler Buckner is better than Jalen Milrow, by all means. <laughs> I don't at all. But I'm just saying it was still 16-3. to three. And So uh, just saying – But all of that is to say we've had a lot of good chats coming in on the Specs chat line. And to say, Saturday, again, it's a nighttime game. You want to hit up Specs now because you don't want to be running out at night when you to get provisions if you run out. So if you're looking for fine wines, if you're looking for good spirits, if you're looking for, you know, a nice case of beer or even some good food to go along with what you've got going. Specs is the place to go. It's a Texas born and bred company. There's a location probably near you or just go to Specs online. Stock up now so that when Saturday comes, you are ready to go for Baylor game day. And you're ready. You're going to know what Baylor has to say because coming out of this, we're going to, we're going to talk with Cameron Stewart from the Locked On Baylor podcast. No matter what you're needing, Specs Same Day Delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world-class wines to hard-to-find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. All right, welcome back. As we mentioned, Cameron Stewart from the Locked on Baylor podcast is here. Cam, thank you for joining us. Yeah, guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Big one this week. Well, yeah, is it, is, yeah, it's a it's a big one for Baylor for sure, right? This yeah, is definitely. Last potential, last game in this long storied rivalry, history rivalry. Uh, and it, it feels like the Baylor fans are going to be pumped. Is that what you're sensing? Yeah, look, and it, it's from a fan standpoint, it's exactly the injection they need or we need because I, I would include myself in that. It has been not the the funnest season so far we're kind of wondering when football is going to start around here um but having you see in for the last time it is it's a big deal and i know i know and we all know it's not as big a deal for ut as it is for the other teams that are on the schedule and welcoming them in or going to austin for the last time but for us yeah it's a big deal obviously this this splits families this uh splits your rooting interest for your life um for a lot of kids who grew up uh, UT fans, some from afar, some from all the way from Massachusetts, um, and then they go to Baylor and and they become diehard Baylor Bears. So yeah, it's a big game, kind of emotionally. It's one that you you don't want to lose, so you you try not to think too much about. Yeah, I mean, I know you know everyone always has Texas circled on the calendar, but I mean, even for Texas, this is a you know obviously they're they're in the playoff race now, so every game's big, and on top of it. I mean, you know, they feel the added pressure, I'm sure, of like this last tour through the Big 12. You know, they don't want the last game against Baylor to be a loss in Waco. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of want to dive right into it. Um, Sawyer Robertson, he's he's been taken over for Blake Shapin. It sounds like it's going to be Sawyer Robertson again out there. Um, 10 for 22 against Long Island. Um, I was able to catch a lot of the Utah game. It just doesn't seem like he's very comfortable out there. It just doesn't, um, you know, have too much experience, it seems like. Have you seen anything to lead you to believe he could maybe turn this around or is it is it a, like a pretty legitimate problem that might not get fixed this week? Yeah, I, I don't think it gets fixed this week. Um, yeah. Y'all, I, I think he's he's got a future as the starting quarterback here. Um but we did not see any significant improvement uh, up against some real low level competition, the likes of Long Island. You, you just you can't go 10 to 22 against Long Island. I don't care if there's, you know, rain, thunder, lightning, hurricane. You, you can't be going 10 for 22 against Long Island. That just can't happen. And I think I've, I've been giving Sawyer the benefit of the doubt because he's coming from a much different system basically his whole life um i i'm familiar with his uh high school coach who runs very much a mike leach kind of offense where it is get the ball out quick 
one read, um, sp- spread it out vertical, win vertically. And where you're, so all that to say, you're not reading a defense very much. And he ran that in high school, obviously played under Leach um, at Mississippi State, mostly uh, in practice rather than in the games. And so he's, he's still a young kid who is just making a major adjustment. It's going to the wide zone run game that that uh, Jeff Grimes is running at Baylor. It looks to be easier for quarterbacks, and, and overall it probably is because they're just not asking that much of you in terms of arm talent, uh, which he has. But it, it's a lot different for him in terms of the progressions he's going through, um, the hot routes, everything like that, the, even the protection. Um, it's a lot different, and we just haven't seen him make that that kind of improvement yet. The kid's got a really talented arm. And that doesn't come across when he's 10 to 22 against Long Island, but um, he can, he'll, he's going to be able to make those throws at some point. It's just about him getting work with these receivers, um, getting to know the system a little bit better. And I, and I know that's weird to say at the end of September for a guy who was in there all of fall camp, but he's thrown a couple picks over the last two weeks that have just been receivers not running the wrong routes or the right routes or him not knowing what the right route is. So clearly it's evidence on the field that they're just, they're just not on the same page right now. And I think Grimes can make a game plan around Sawyer, but in terms of utilizing his strengths, um, it's not going to, it's not going to turn around this week. I don't think. So not only is Baylor down Blake Shapen, the starting quarterback, Dominic Richardson, the starting running back is down. Uh, so you, you're losing a lot of firepower out of those two. What What's the story with the running back situation? Yeah, so that that's honestly just as big a loss almost to have to not have Dominic Richardson in there either. Obviously, someone y'all are familiar with too with his days at Oklahoma State, but he had definitely come out and looked like the feature back, looked like he just knew he was going to fit well into this offense, and he did through the first couple games and in times where Baylor – couldn't run the ball all that much because they were down um, a lot of the first two games. And so he is, he fit in really seamlessly with that him and Richard Reese together. Looks like that's going to be a potent backfield once they work and get into their hands and, and, you know, uh, have a figured out offensive line and, and be ahead in these games. And so not having him, it makes you dip into uh, a really inexperienced running back room outside of those two guys. And, And they have a lot of, um, uh, prospect talent in two freshmen, Dawson Pendergrass and Bryson Washington, who uh, took the majority of the carries in the, in the game against Long Island. Dawson Pendergrass went over 20 carries, had over 100 yards, had a touchdown, uh, both true freshmen. So looked really good, and uh, they were good at yards after contact, um, first contact. It, and, you know, again, that's coming against Long Island. But those are guys that are just not going to be carrying it 20, 25 times a game if, if you're going to be any kind of successful. And I think they were kind of learned their lesson with that a little bit last year with riding Richard Reese, who was also a true freshman. Um, and it, things started to slow down at the end. And so did Baylor's offense. He took a lot of hits, made a lot of carries. And I think not having, I mean, I think clearly it was intended in the off season that you needed to bring another co-running back in to split up those carries. They did. Now he's hurt. And you're down your most experienced skill guy as well as your quarterback. So uh, it's it's not a good situation for Baylor. It wasn't a good situation to start with. They had both those guys in week one and lost to Texas State and definitely got amplified with not having um, those guys out on the field much since then. Cameron, you, you've mentioned the zone running scheme. You've mentioned the passing game that forces the quarterback to kind of go through those progressions. When I hear both of those things, I think that's, you know, those are two things where you got to have an offensive line clicking, communicating, and playing well. It doesn't seem like that's been a strength so far this year for Baylor. What is the story with this Baylor offensive line? Is it injuries? Is it maybe recruiting? Is it just development of the guys on campus? What What's kind of been going on up front there for the Baylor offense? Great question, man. <laughs> it, it's been a few things, and it's been – none of which would be the easiest, which would have been injuries to to qualify because they haven't had injuries. Now, um, it did play better. It did play a lot better as a unit um, this last weekend. Um, and I think I think offensive line is one that you can uh, take at face value even against a bad team, even w- when they're playing well, and they played well. They only had one pre-snap penalty this week, which they had eight of eight against Texas State. I mean, that's just... You can't excuse that. You just can't excuse that. And it is new guys, um, two 
two transfers coming in, the Barrington brothers from BYU. Um, we heard they were going to be the leaders of this offensive line and, and really get back to uh, that being their bread and butter like it was two years ago when they won the Big 12 and, and the Sugar Bowl. Uh, it has not been the case so far. Um, and it's been kind of, if not one thing, then the other, uh, they couldn't block anybody in week one. Um, they, they really struggled to, to push the line and, and move the ball on the ground in week two against Utah, even though they weren't giving up the negative plays and the sacks and the pre-snap penalties as much. And this past week they were just fine. Uh, they were fine. Um, again, not a lot of negative plays, only one false start. So I think it's coming around that said. You've got, you know, I don't want to take anything away from their performance against Long Island because they did play well, but you do have a different level of competition coming in this week, especially in that front seven. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we have seen UT can dial it up, man. And and that's something that is really putting a lot of pressure on. I mean, no pun intended, putting a lot of extra pressure on a guy who has barely started at quarterback an offensive line that is beleaguered. Um, I think that's going to be, a real key for, for Baylor and therefore a good chance to win the game for UT just in that, in that front four and in the trenches. So it, it just hasn't come together yet. And we didn't know what they were practicing all spring. That's how bad it looked the first two games anyway. So um, I, I just, I hope it's something where they just need to gel a little bit more together and get game reps together. Uh, but it has not been good so far. Yeah. When, when, in my experience, anytime someone says, boy, that's a good question. That means, yeah, I really don't know. I don't yeah. know the answer to how to fix that. <laughs> There's, It's either no answer or multiple answers on this one. I just, I don't know why it hasn't come together yet. And it is young, it's new, but these are guys who have, they play college football before. They should know the snap count. They work, you work on that in practice. So I don't know why it hasn't quite come, all come together yet. Flipping over to the other side of the defense, uh, Texas fans may recognize Byron Bonds, former Longhorn, transferred to Utah State. Now he's in Waco co-team leader with two sacks mm -hmm. uh but when i watch the defense i mean you expect dave aranda have a good defense his scheme is always going to be good he mm -hmm. the dude knows football he didn't forget yeah. that <laughs> but when i when i went back and watched the baylor games against texas state and and utah it seemed to me like a lot of the scheme was there. It's just the execution wasn't quite there. Like linebackers would get sucked in and leaving mm -hmm. running lanes open or, you know, the secondary, which is a young secondary, was struggling to, to yeah. stay tight. What is Baylor going to have to do to slow down Texas receivers or stop the run game like Jonathan Brooks? What's what's the key on that side of the ball? Yeah, I think you hit on it a little bit in, in the phrasing of that question. And it was it's been freelancing that we've seen. Uh, kill them. I mean, literally cost them points. And in, in that Texas State game, it happened a couple of times. And I said it even in this game last weekend against Long Island, they only give up seven points. It's a by all and by all measures, a good defensive performance. But there's just a couple of plays where I'm like, and including Long Island's only touchdown where it was, they're not containing at all. Uh, they're not setting an edge at all. Yeah. And yeah. Um, like that's I mean, that's textbook stuff that that's almost an inexcusable stuff. Uh, especially with such a defensive minded head coach. And so I see that and I say, I mean, they just, they need to clean that up or else a, a good team is going to expose that 10 ways to Sunday. I mean, even, even ones that aren't great at running the ball are going to, are they going to run to the outside on you? They're going to bounce it outside. And obviously Texas has the beef and the speed up front to be able to, to run behind that. I think Sark is going to uh, really expose some things in this Baylor defense. That that's the big one in the run game that I think is the easiest and should be the one they, they can clean up first, but talking about that secondary um, it's had some flashes, but you said it, they're really young. They're really young. I made a note of it during the game on Saturday, uh, Corey Gordon, Carl Williams, DJ Coleman, they all had pass deflections. Carl Williams had an interception, and that's great. And I'm not going to say these guys are going to be bad. But that's three true freshmen right there. Yeah. And going up against one of the best offensive units in the nation, that is, that's just asking for it. And, and the other problem, too, that Baylor has is – the star position has just not been what it was when Jalen, since Jalen Petrie left. And I, you know, you're not going to just pluck an all American defensive player of the year in the conference every year, but um, that is something that is going to, ex they can get exposed by Bryson Jackson, seventh year guy um, who's played a lot of linebacker and special teams um, and, and is a good pass rusher from the linebacker position all of a sudden goes to star and you find out he can't cover. 
He just can't cover. Um, and having all the weapons that you need to focus on with the Longhorns coming in and being that young at the back, you need to be solid at star because that is someone who, in theory, you'll have a guy who is not an explosive playmaker uh, going up against the star, but they become explosive playmakers when it's up against Bryce at Jackson this year. So to not have that safety blanket either and not being able to really clog off the middle of the field uh, is going to make it a lot tougher and put some a lot of one-on-one situations with these young guys. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm hoping Baylor has the speed in the middle that they can keep some guys back and try and take away the middle of the field with their linebackers, but um, it, it's it's something they've struggled with so far this season. So if Baylor's secondary can make some plays early in the game, I think that goes miles towards helping uh, those young guys' confidence. And that that's what I would need to see from a Baylor fan standpoint to feel even a little bit comfortable uh, about that game as it goes on. Cameron, this is only uh, a 15-point spread right now. I know the conversation and all the discourse makes it seem like a 30-point spread. Yeah. It's not. It's only a 15 point spread right now. Um, You know, when Texas was going up against Wyoming, which was about a 30 point spread, the conversation was, what can we find out about this Texas team? What can we learn against Wyoming? And what it kind of turned into was, okay, Wyoming has a pretty legitimately good run defense. So we can learn a little bit about the Texas running game for those Texas fans that are just kind of penciling in a win. And they're wondering what can Texas learn from this game? Is there a unit on this Baylor team that you would consider the strength of the team that maybe Texas fans can take something away from if this, you know, unit performs well, or if this unit doesn't perform well, that might be sticky as Texas goes into maybe a tougher portion of the schedule. Like is, is there a strength of this Baylor team right now? Yeah, honestly, it's sad to say, but pretty close to no. And I say that because if you had, um, uh, Blake Shapen in at quarterback and, and Dom Richardson at running back, I would say the running backs and also the receivers I, I was impressed by in week one. Uh, that was a big question mark for, for Baylor coming in. Do they have any playmakers on the outside? And I think they do. But again, going back to that point of, of Sawyer coming in and clearly not getting a lot of works with the ones. I mean, they announced Blake as the starter back in back in May. So I'm guessing he got a lot of the reps with the ones and that miscommunication that's been there. It, it doesn't allow for the confidence that I had before. And a lot of people talked up Baylor's pass rush this year. I am a believe it when I see it kind of guy um, with Gabe Hall, who's supposed to be a all big 12 guy. I just haven't seen it yet from him. And I will, I will say if things go right, their linebackers have shown me some good things this year. Um, it has not been consistent enough. And I talked about it in the last answer, some of the freelancing in there, but I like Mike Smith. I like Byron Vaughn. He made a great play uh, on Saturday for a sack. I think if though, and Matt Jones, an Odessa Permian guy who is a captain on the defensive side, who I've been impressed by. If those guys are locked in and they are directing uh, the rest of the defense where to go and, and kind of in their bag a little bit, um, I think that's going to be uh, Baylor's key towards at least keeping it close on Saturday because um, I think with Dave Aranda, he can dial up some looks that will at least get Quinn Ewers on the, on the clipboard, on the iPad, on the sideline and going over what's going on. And, and just having a couple of those where you mess with, with his head and, and confuse him a little bit, that opens up an opportunity for Baylor. So all that, a long way of saying, I think the linebackers, if they come to play, can really kind of tilt things in Baylor's favor on the defensive side of the ball. And, and that, that only lasts so long because UT is talented on offense, but just to plant a seed in there and, and make some big plays early will go a long way. That is interesting because one of the, you know, one of the current talking, talking points right now for Texas fans is Sark, mostly Sark. And then I guess you can relate it to Quinn. Maybe you're having a tough time um, adjusting mid game when the defense comes out and plays a coverage that Texas is not expecting. So if you think that's something Aranda is going to be able to do, um, that that might be a big key for Texas just to see if they do throw out something unexpected, yeah. you know, are these guys finally going to be able to make a quick adjustment and not have it take till the fourth quarter like it did against Wyoming. So, so that's definitely interesting. Specifically yeah. And I, and I think that Dave three, three, has five kind defense. of a plan with that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I would say specifically with that three, three, five defense, that's what's 
really kind of uh, been Sark's bugaboo, if you will, at yeah. least according to the, you know, a lot of the fans watching. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how Baylor does this. You know, Wyoming dropped eight people into coverage, yeah, all the linebackers. Yeah. I don't think we're going to see that from Baylor, but but they're going to have to – it was interesting to me, Aranda said, they're going to have to limit the space that the Texas receivers have in order without putting them on an island with the right. DBs and getting one on one. Yeah, and I think that's going to want them to. I think I think from from hearing that um, that that tells me we're going to try and bring some pressure here, and, and we're going to try to make this a game uh, of of underneath stuff, um, and in kind of a a Belichick way in that of hey, we're going to make you go down the field. But we're we're just not going to make this easy for you. And the more plays we keep you out on the field, the more likely you are to make a mistake. Um, and and I think that's probably what we will see of uh, of guys kind of playing deep. Even though I mean, Dave is definitely a, a press man kind of coach. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see those corners play off a little bit, bring some pressure, and, and kind of make them dink and dunk you to death, which I'm not saying Texas can't do that by no means. Um, I think Sark would like that to a certain extent, uh, but to to try and make it more difficult on them. I just wish Lincoln Riley was on the other side, man. Dave knows how to draw up a plan against that guy. I, I think Lincoln is still having nightmares about Dave Aranda defenses, but yeah, that's what I think we'll, we'll see. And I, I think Sark knows the weaknesses on this Baylor defense. That said, this this is no expert analysis here, truly. Just the way I heard Dave talk on Monday at the press conference. Just from what we've seen in the past and that tone he used, I think there is something glaring on tape that he that he really likes. So is that going to be the difference in the game? I don't know, y'all. I don't. But when Dave's talking like that, I'm listening. All right. He's like E.F. Hutton, a reference Aaron won't get. All right. The 114th rivalry meeting. <laughs> potentially the last at least for a very long time yeah i know i'm looking forward to it cam thanks so much for coming on uh we appreciate it. is it where can fans find you yeah thanks so much for having me y'all so i i'm on on twitter x um that's at real cam stewart s-t-u-a-r-t hosting locked on baylor um, we actually have an episode out this week that's with drake toll from locked on big 12 so we we talk a little bit more big 12 in it um, i've got some other longhorn experts on this week so if y'all are looking for a uh, full angle game preview we talk a lot of ut this week as well so uh yeah check us out anywhere you can get podcasts and on youtube and and that's me on twitter at real cam stewart um I will try to be funny as I can on Twitter as well. So it's not all doom and gloom, but uh, yeah, we, we love talking about football and obviously big 12 stuff too. So as long as y'all are still here, come on and, uh, and follow the coverage. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining. Running report with Cam Stewart from the Locked On Baylor podcast. I'm curious, uh, Nash wasn't able to make it. So Nash, I want to hear you. Get your thoughts. What did you What did you see in here? Uh, I mean, honestly, that really stuck out, uh, stood out to me. At the end, him saying that uh, he thinks that Dave Veranda might have noticed something. Uh, that's going to have to be a hell of a something <laughs> for how <laughs> Baylor's looked this year. To, to, because I, I think, like, it, like even if, even if the teams were even, like Baylor, it's just like going through the going through the stats. They're not scoring a fit. Like if you want to talk about, if you think Texas isn't efficient on offense, <laughs> boy, do I have news for you. <laughs> the bad news bears are in town, but no, I, no, I'm not trying to you know drive the stake into them. But yeah, it's just uh, no one is going to be in defense. Is, it's just it, it it doesn't look like a favorable matchup for Baylor, and then. You got the backup running back versus uh, coming in and the backup quarterback. I don't know. Like, I think I think also like he was that, that him talking about early on uh, the quarterback. I I think that what, what he was saying. I'm like, man, I I'm kind of feeling confident that maybe this is the week that he tests that arm out and he he, he tries to. And you know what? That's not the week you want to be doing it this week. You don't want to be doing it this week. Not not so, these defense backs. Nash, why why is it you were not able to make the pot the the taping? <laughs> okay, so this is this is a, <laughs> it, it, some people are you know choose to believe it or not. I'm on the couch trying to do some prep for Baylor. <laughs> I fall asleep from the offense. They 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 literally they literally <laughs> put me to sleep. So you know what? 
maybe they do lull the Texas defense to sleep and then they attack the <laughs> Texas defense that way. But I just, Nash, I hope that doesn't happen to you on Saturday. I mean, you got a no, job no, to do. No. You gotta, you gotta be clipping. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I'll be sitting here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, Cam- I, at the at the end of the day, I'll tell you what. If 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 I'm getting put to sleep by the Baylor Texas game, there Notre Dame versus Ohio State should be that that should be keeping me up. That the, there's always there's actually several good games on at the same time. <laughs> several several uh, several's uh, uh, <laughs> selling real short there. <laughs> yeah, I I you know we we Aaron alluded to this in the interview. It's only like a 15 point spread, but and we'll get it's into only, the Baylor only, game. Yeah. We'll do our predictions tomorrow. We, we're all going through and we're going to do our predictions of what we think is going to happen in the game as well as the final score. I don't see where the hell Baylor gets their points from. It is weird. It is weird because, like, I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, I was I came up with that question. I was like, what is the strength of this team? And I was like, he's going to say nothing because there is no strength of the team, and he pretty much did. And I'm looking at this 15-point spread, and I'm like, Baylor's got no offensive line. Texas is just going to. But then I'm thinking, like, this team was in the game against a good Utah team in the fourth quarter, which was just weird to me. It's like, all well, right, that was Whistler Robertson. There's, 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 there's a couple of factors. Who was playing quarterback for Utah? That's that's number one. Cam Rising was out. They're playing yeah, the, the, same, quarterback. the same quarterback situation they had against Florida. Number two, it, well, yeah, but number two, they are playing in 100-degree heat. And I'm sorry, those guys from Utah aren't used yeah. to that. It was a trap yeah. spot. I just it like, was, yeah, absolutely. Three, they sold, they absolutely sold out to stop the run. And Utah could not take care, couldn't defend that at all. So it was a close game going late, but, but the running that Utah was doing through the first four and a half, three and a half quarters started paying off late. Those, yeah. they started getting eight, nine, 10 yards per carry late in the game. And that's how they were – then they get a quick turnover. That's how they were able to, to go from a 13-6 deficit with two minutes left to winning 2013. I, I can't – if Baylor sells out to stop the run against Texas like they did against Utah, uh, game manager or not, Quinn Ewers is going to tear them up. You know, no, I mean, I agree. Like, I'm picking Texas, and I'm picking Texas by a lot. Just when I, when I keep looking at it, I'm like – 15 point spreads kind of weird. Utah score is kind of weird. So like my guard is up like 5%, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to pick Texas to win by a lot of points. And so I agree with all that. Sorry to any Baylor fans, but really I'm not sorry at all. But uh, <laughs> it, it really don't just say it like, if you don't mean it. Nash. No, when I say this, right. When I say that they had their moment and the, they had their moment in the spotlight. Okay. It may, it wasn't always a good moment, but Baylor, they had their little rise uh, in the little in the two, in the two thousand teens. They've just gone back to like they're they're just reverting back to the like. I I always thought the Baylor that I grew up seeing, <laughs> they were this was like no, <laughs> it was never it was if you were in a game where you were within thirty five points of Baylor, that was a bad game. Growing up, yeah. and. I, yeah, I just, well, they were consistently not just playing as well, but beat. And then like, they were actually like a good team. I'm not going to, we don't need to go into the weeds on how they were a good team and all that stuff. But uh, I, just, I love this uh, comment. I love this comment so much. It is <laughs> confident gambling advice, like alerting the people from user. From, from two broke. Broke. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Hey, hey, I will say, if I go ten and two against the spread this week, I'm I, I'm submitting my resignation. I'm moving to Vegas. <laughs> we're, we're we're choosing a new career path. Do we have the? I need to. I should know what the actual total is in this game, but I don't know. I doubt I'm taking the over because I'm probably going to pick Baylor to score like seven points if I had to guess. I can tell you here real quickly. The uh, over under is at fifty one and a half points. With a fifteen point. Spread with a 15 point spread. I'm probably going to be under that slightly, but I don't know. I probably I would rather take the the side. Well, and uh, like uh, Danny said earlier, I I don't think that you can ever. I don't think you'll ever see Steve Sarke a Steve Sarkeesian team jump out in front and have a second half offense or uh, like they're they're never gonna you're never gonna have a first and second half offense in the same game. Those are. 
because if Steve Sarkeesian, if he get if he has that scheme where he he jumps out in front, you're you're just gonna see him clock the ball every single time that they have the ball in the second half. They're gonna run it. We're gonna we're gonna hold on. We're gonna drain forty seconds off. We're gonna run again, drain forty seconds off, and we're just gonna rinse and repeat until y'all's will is broken. I think it's fair. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, it'll it'll be interesting. I definitely want to see them come out and uh, attack through the air if they can, and then be good. The I want to see them hang eighty. So I, I think what we're seeing is we could see a really nice game from Jonathan Brooks this week. And we saw a really nice game from Jonathan Brooks last week. The boy's a star. And I'm telling you right now, if you'd like to help support Jonathan Brooks, scan this QR code. Go check out Elite Sports Memorabilia. They have got the finest gear, including Jonathan Brooks. Look at that. Nash did it. The, the, full, the full signature. The, the full, full name, signature. Full name, Not like, like JB24. It's Jonathan Brooks, the full signature. Nash got that from Elite Sports Memorabilia, right, Nash? Yes, and they come off. Uh, some of them, uh, I, I will say like Jatavian is not authenticated, but they do come authenticated for the most part. Oh, he, he will let you know. He, he's got He's got pictures and videos of the signings, and yeah. including the video of the latest signing, with Malik Murphy in the house. Malik Murphy autographed jerseys, helmets, ready to go. Jordan Winnington autographed helmets and jerseys, ready to go. Uh, Quinn Ewers memorabilia is still up there. Jatavian Sanders memorabilia is still up there. He's got a lot of gear that looks great on the wall and is a great gift for yourself or friends and family. I'm telling you, ESM has, not only is it great stuff, but it's the customer service is fantastic. It is quick. It is easy. They get you the stuff mailed to you. It is, I can't say enough superlatives about it. It helps the players because these are NIL deals. It helps us because Elite Sports Memorabilia is the best sponsor we could possibly have wished for for this show. And it helps you because you get some awesome autographed Texas memorabilia, authenticated, good, good stuff. Guys, seriously, scan the QR code. It is the way to go. I know we've seen other people in on this show, other loyal viewers, like Danny Juarez has said he's bought ESM gear and is happy with it. Um, you know, don't sleep on ESM, just like Max Jefferson is saying, don't sleep on Baxter. I don't know if we're going to see Baxter this week. We'll, well see. I, I don't but, think people are sleeping on Baxter. That, that's the craziest no, thing. Exactly. We're not sleep, just just because we like Jonathan Brooks doesn't mean we're sleeping on a guy. <laughs> exactly. Dang, damn good point, Nash. And too broke to pay attention. No. Nobody did win the Murphy jersey. So there is a free compliments of Elite Sports Memorabilia. There is a free Malik Murphy autographed jersey available to be won this week. Tune in tomorrow, watch the show, and when it's done, the first person to leave the correct score of the Baylor-Texas game in the comments of tomorrow's show will win the autographed Malik Murphy jersey. It's up for grabs. Nobody's nailed it yet. It is there. But you know what? If you don't want to if you don't want to luck your way into it, just go buy it. It's affordable. It looks good. It's clean. It's tight. <laughs> you don't need to wait and, and luck into that jersey. Granted free is nice, but they're not that expensive. And they are they are they look good. And you know these are game jerseys. Too broke to pay attention. He's getting the that jersey this game. All right, good luck hey, with that. And get that comment in early because the first comment to have the score predicted is the one that will win it. That's right. So you better jump on it tomorrow. Tomorrow's show is going to be action-packed. We are going to break down everything like how many, inter how many interceptions is Baylor's quarterback going to throw? That could be one of the questions. We're going to break down oh, our hey. predictions for the game. Oh, yeah. They, hey, hey, these guys are going to be licking their chops. I think – I'm going to save it for tomorrow, but yeah. All right, save it for tomorrow. Okay, that's a tease. There we go. Yeah, no, it's going to be a good show tomorrow. Um, Everyone, we got a lot of people in here. Please like the video. If you like the show, the easiest way to make sure the show keeps happening is if you like the video. It really helps us out. Um, We really appreciate it. Uh, we love all the viewers. But yeah, like the video. And then tomorrow's going to be fun, man. I, I love the prediction show. Oh, and it's Thursday. Should have uh, Kyle Umling on, dropping some Aggie facts. I mean, Thursday, you know, it might be my favorite show of the week. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, there's 145 people watching live right now. 
if we don't have at least half of that in likes, I'm going to be disappointed in each and every one of you. Well, don't be sorry. Don't be threatening. Just oh no, I, don't know I am. <laughs> I am going to be disappointed in each and every one of you. If you, I'm going to love our viewers. Regardless, if you don't, honestly. if you don't watch I, the video, I'm, I'm going to do the Texas Every Play video. Heart. It's unconditional love, but you can still be disappointed and love the viewers. I appreciate all of you watching. I really do. We. I feel like that. I feel like that's the definition but, of conditional love. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not love. Disappointment does not equal love. Those are two separate things. A father can be disappointed in his children, but still love them in their actions. It's it, we're talking actions. Oh, now I drove off viewers because we're down to 133 live viewers. Yeah. All right, the rest of you, I love you all. Go hit the like button. We appreciate you watching this. Subscribe to the channel. OP Live is live all day long with fantastic content. Stick around for Anwar Richardson's old fashioned sports show coming up. Uh, followed by House Divided with Jeff Ketchum and, and Chad Hastings. We've got Football with Friends with Alex Dunlap. He's already working on his offensive uh, deep dig grades, which is on the OB uh, on Orange Bloods itself. I've got my column up coming up later today. If you're not a member, subscribe and join. I, I think you'll enjoy the breakdown of what, what I'm going to be posting today. So, guys, thank you again so much. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Get ready to, to get your score predictions in. Somebody could win that jersey. Too broke to pay attention says it's him. We'll see. Hat for Aaron Little and Nash at Nash Talks Texas. I'm Travis Gailey. Have a great day.